We've been talking about how people show up in the Bible after Pentecost and how they are demonstrating their salvation and being filled with the Spirit. And so we've had two examples, uh, Simon and how his conversion went, and then the eunuch. And so we're going to continue that on, and we're going to see another conversion today. I would be willing to wager all of my assets, including my wife Tammy and my mother-in-law Belinda. I would wager all of those assets that the story of Saul's conversion to the Apostle Paul is by far the greatest conversion story ever told. Now, for that to be the greatest story ever told, you have to start at one end that's extreme and go to another end that's extreme. Because if there's not a whole lot of difference in your life between one conversion and the other, it wouldn't be the greatest conversion ever told. But we will start to see today why this is the greatest conversion story ever told to this date. No one has had this type of conversion. Now there are good denominations, good and honest Christians who believe that there should be a specific sign, a feeling, or a demonstration when a person becomes a believer in Jesus as the Messiah, our risen Savior, our Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But once that conversion or belief is realized and accepted, some believe the next step is a specific sign or feeling or demonstration of being filled with the promised Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not here to dispute that claim. That certainly can happen. And what I'm looking at here is what are the biblical examples that we have to understand how this process can take place? I do not ever want to put God in a box. I do not have that capability. <laughs> and if I do, I feel like I'm not giving him the praise and the fortitude that I know he can accomplish whatever he wants to in any way he wants to do that. But we have studied those two conversions in the book of Acts of Simon and the Ethiopian eunuch, and they're very unique from each other. So we jumped right over the example of the initial filling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. That first anointing of the Spirit has been well, well scrutinized and studied and held up as an example. The next example after the eunuch is the greatest conversion ever told. Now, I want to bring you up to date with where we are. We last less, less left Philip, the evangelist, being transported in the blink of an eye and the eunuch going on his way rejoicing. So it tells us, now when they came up out of the water, this is the eunuch and Philip, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. See, the eunuch, when that happened, and Philip disappeared at that moment, the eunuch didn't dive back into the water and say, where's Philip? I need Philip. What's happened to him? And he didn't travel back up the road to Jerusalem saying, I need Philip. Where's Philip? I need to know more. He didn't do that. He wasn't panicked that he still needed more teaching, more understanding, more signs of his conversion. Rather, he knew that when Philip was caught away from him in that instant, he had received a visual confirmation that his faith was confirmed and that his act of obedience of being baptized according to the Lord's word was acceptable. And he was content with what had occurred even to the point of rejoicing. And that's all it took. 
So in chapter 9, Luke brings us back to the story of Saul. Now we need to set the stage and really understand Saul's mental state, his mental state of mind. So then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, bring them bound to Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, in Acts 8, 1 through 3, we saw that Saul was consenting to his death. Okay? And that was Stephen's death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. Now, the Greek word for breathing is only found this one time in the Bible. And it's a combination word. And it means specifically to inhale. Inhale. Now, one theologian described this as the element from which he drew his breath. Also, the Greek word translates translated as threats here, is a singular word, not plural. The word should read more like this. Still breathing in threat and murder. The very breath that he inhaled created a ravaging animal against the disciples of the Lord. Now you may say, he was breathing and threats and murder against the disciples. But we've got to understand what is going on here. And the Greek wording is very specific. Not that it's not telling us that he is announcing these threats and murders to uh, the people of the way. He may have been doing that, but that's not what the verse tells us. The verse tells us more that what he is living on, what he is desiring, is coming into him. So, this, and I'm just going to speculate here, that with Paul's intimate knowledge of the scriptures, remember he, he tells the scribes and the Pharisees that he had more knowledge than they did because he had been studying the scriptures so much. So I'm gonna, we're just speculating here because we don't know this for certain that he may have been using Psalm 69.9 to motivate his hatred for those of the way because the zeal of your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. He cites part of this verse Paul does in Romans 15.3. And the Gospel of John uses it as he describes Jesus turning the tables over in the temple. Now perhaps this verse is Saul's motivating vision. And, it, and possibly what made the Apostle Paul so full of remorse in his unique ability to truly understand the mercy of Jesus because he started so far away. Now, Paul later acknowledges this conduct during his trial where he stood before King Agrippa in Acts 26. It says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue, compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them, even to foreign cities. Even Paul 
recognized after his conversion how evil his thoughts and his actions were. Now, understanding the meaning behind the words used here in the Bible can really give us a sense of what is actually going on. For example, think about the different translations that we can look at and, and how those translations can change your mind about what is being said. This particular verse, these different translations say, breathing out murderous threats, breathing out threats of murder, uttering threats, breathing threats and murder, breathing threats, threatening and slaughter, full of menace and the fury of murder, spewing death threats, whose every breath was a threat of destruction. All of those describe what we could vision that here's Paul standing up and just screaming out to people, I'm going to get you, I'm going to kill you, you know, you blaspheme against the heavenly father, the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do it, do it now. I'll imprison you, I'll beat you. But he didn't laugh about that. That wasn't his concern. He was so consumed. You know, some people, when they, they get, when they're arrested or you're punishing them and you get, the guy's doing it, they're laughing about it. Ah, this is fun. This was not fun for Paul. It was a burden on Paul. He had to stop these people from blaspheming his Lord of the Old Testament. Many of them that we saw there have threats, and they say they're plural. That gives the sense of they just keep repeating those threats that Paul is on and on. And that's not what the verse says. It says it was breathing. He was taking that hatred in. And then it was coming out of him. Now, even if Paul's actions were directed towards others, the impulse behind them is something that is first compelling him to be that. Paul's hatred. And until that root is cured, there can be no change in him. The very breath that strengthens him is anger and hostility towards these people of the way. What he breathes in, he will breathe out. Don't we say that today? What you put in will come out. So that's the picture that this verse is giving us. And yet, I've read it several times, and I just see him up there, you know, hey, you're getting you, I'm getting you. But never to the depth of what the verse was really telling us. Now, those of the way, the same wording is found in the Gospel of John. Who is the way? And why do we use that term, the way? I remember when I was in high school, I got a Bible. It's a soft-bound Bible, and the title of the Bible was not the Holy Bible. The title was The Way. And many of you may have seen that Bible in the past. The Way. And that's why this came that way, is it's The Way. And it's the same wording that is found and is attributed to those of the early faith. We see that in John 14. And he says, Jesus says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So as he journeyed, this is Saul, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now Damascus is outside of Israel's borders and which is very appropriate for this action to take place outside of Israel's borders. Here is the apostle to the Gentiles. And he receives his calling outside of Israel proper at that time. 
but it's still within the area of land that was originally promised to Abraham in Genesis 15, 18. That promise extends the land as far as the, the river Euphrates. And it was there in this Gentile land at the time, close to Damascus, that Paul was traveling. The Greek word for shown signifies to flash around like lightning. Acts 26 will further explain the intensity of this light. It says, while this, and this is again Paul speaking to Agrippa, while thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven brighter than the midday sun shining around me in those who journeyed with me. Now, some supposed that this means Paul was on a horse or a mule or a donkey or a camel and he is knocked to the ground. Does it say that? It does not, does it? It says that he just fell to the ground. And there's many instances throughout the Bible, including with Jesus, where Jesus is said to have fallen upon the ground in Mark 14, 35, while in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the same exact word used here. And so he could have just been walking and been struck and just fell on the ground. But I point that out to you. We read things into the Bible, don't we? We have a picture of what we're reading when we're reading it. And sometimes it can throw us off. Now, is this specifically important? No, not really. I just pointed out that we can read things or miss things in God's Word that are intricate details that really set the keys to where we can understand what the true meaning is. And see, Paul was overwhelmed with the brightness of the glory that had shone around him, and he just fell to the ground. Now, what is said there, that sentiment is not all uncommon in the New Testament or in the Old Testament. For example, in Daniel, he was confronted with the glory of the Lord, and it says this, Daniel is said to have seen the glory of the Lord, and he falls to the ground. And the repetition of the name is a way of showing emphasis and also at times a personal affinity. I'm speaking to you, Abraham, Abraham. I'm speaking to you, Simon, Simon. I'm speaking to you, Saul, Saul. It gets our attention. See, the Lord is making a personal, emphatic, and targeted call to Saul. No one else. It is personal by calling out his name. It is emphatic because he uses it twice. And it is targeted because the accusation leveled at him is, why do you persecute me? Jesus, who you got to think, who is really unknown to Saul, he's just thinking about what he's been taught and what the priests have taught him, and he has this vision in his head of God the Father and that the Messiah will come someday, but this Jesus guy is not the Messiah. Josephus tells us in his writings that there were numerous people throughout the early first century before Christ and the century after Christ, many people were claiming to be the Messiah. This act that Jesus was doing was not unique. Many people were already doing this. And those people, when something happened to them, they were found out and to death or imprisoned. The same thing that happened to Jesus. But Jesus did not do anything to deserve that because he was the true Messiah. But isn't it interesting that Jesus speaks to Saul, and he doesn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Rather, he says, why are you persecuting me? If we think that through, that whole statement, why are you persecuting me, Saul? It's another clear indication 
that we have eternal salvation. You see, the people of the Lord are in the Lord. An attack against them is an attack against Jesus. The alignment with Jesus brings the believers into union with Him in a permanent covenant relationship. And there's evidence in that. Because He could have said, why are you persecuting my brothers and sisters? No, why are you persecuting me? Now it is important to understand the relationship that existed at this point between Saul and Jesus. Saul was a law-observant Pharisee. Not only that, he was one while the temple still stood. And the rites and the sacrifices for purification from sin were still being practiced. And yet Paul was an enemy of Jesus because he had not come to participate in the new covenant. (coughs) Hebrews 7 18 and 8, 13 and Hebrews 10, 9 indicate that that law that Saul was so adamant about had been set aside. It was obsolete. It was annulled by the death and resurrection of Christ. Colossians 2, 14 tells us that the law is nailed to the cross. Christ is the embodiment and fulfillment of the law. Jesus was crucified on the cross. The law was made absolutely obsolete. And it's even stated that again by Paul in Ephesians 2.15. Paul does not see this, though, at this point. So we must hold fast to the truth that God has sent His Son into the world, that He has established a new covenant in His blood. And the only way to be saved is through belief in what He has done. We have to be ready to teach this and defend this because so many others are going to give you half-truths, sort of truths, or, yeah, that's one way to get to heaven, but you could do it the Hindu way. You, you could do it the Catholic way if you just live a good life and come sit in the booth and repent of your sins and do so many rosaries. And, you know, if you really do something bad, you might have to reach really far down in your pockets and give to the church and you'll be forgiven. you got to work for this. And that is not the message in the Bible. It is simply by grace. See, Paul was chosen specifically to be an apostle of Jesus. A very unique... Yeah, yeah, it's blank from there on. I just didn't have time to do more. But Paul was chosen to be an apostle of Jesus. And the events that surround his conversion were necessary. They are different than all the other apostles. He was not at Pentecost. He didn't have that experience. This was necessary for the validation of his ministry for himself and for those who would interact with him in the future, such as the other apostles, other disciples. People's conversions now occur in accord with what is written in the Scriptures. And those who are placed in the ministry have the words of Scriptures to explain their requirements to serve as ministers in the church. They didn't have that then. This is all being created in the book of Acts. Acts tells us the transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. What took place for that to happen? That whole book is about explaining to us how that process went about and the different ways that it went about. Jesus knocks. Evil knocks the door down and just comes on in. Here's another example of that that Jesus is doing to Saul. He didn't kill him. Because he was killing his people. He was killing Jesus himself. You have to think about it. Our democracy tries to convince people that this way is better. This way is better or that way is better. We have a choice. Dictators do what? If you disagree, kill you. It's a whole lot easier to shut somebody up by killing them than it is to convince them that your way is right. Jesus takes 
the high road. He takes the most difficult path. He just knocks. If you don't answer, he moves on to the next door. Yes. But the bottom line here is. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love your input because you've reinforced this message of what Jesus is asking him. And so we will see in the next part two how that conversation continues and what happens. The conversion has not happened yet. It has begun. Jesus has not. He has made a dramatic appearance to one individual for one reason and we're given that description for our benefit primarily so that when we read his letters in the Bible, we can say, yes, he truly was a man of God because he was so far at the other extreme, no one, no human being ever alive has had the hatred towards the Messiah that Paul had. Picture that in your mind. No one, not Hitler, not the dictators of the past, Nero, all of those people. Saul was so bad, but yet so smart that God said, I can use you, but I'm not going to make you. And that's the message we need to get across as we share that story to other people. We're not going to, we can't beat you over the head with the Bible. Jesus is not going to beat you over the head with his word. He's going to knock, and hopefully you'll open and you'll listen. If not, he'll move on to the next door. Maybe he'll come back and knock again, but you're not a guaranteed that. And that's why we need to be on our game so that we're ready to share that story and share it in a loving way, not in a, if you don't stop what you're doing, you're going to go straight to hell. It's, man, there's a better way to live than what you're living. Would you be interested in knowing? I'll end with this statement, and I've come to truly believe this. You can't feed those who are not hungry. 